It's June 9th, 2022, and welcome to Policy on the Frontier. My name is David Lees, and I'm your host today. The Frontier Center for Public Policy is about better public policy for a better tomorrow. Our topic today, the state of Canada's economy. Canada faces a myriad of serious economic challenges. On May the 8th, the Canadian consumer price inflation hit a three-decade high, adding pressure on the Bank of Canada to continue with major uh, interest rate increases. This is at a time of record-level government deficits and historically high debt levels, and at the same time, Canada's dismal track records on productivity, regulations, and energy policy appear to be setting the stage for economic recession and decline. But what do we make of uh, this situation as Canada continues to slide in terms of various indexes, including a most recent one from the OECD, which documents Canada's dead last in, in per capita GDP growth for the coming decades, not just the coming year, but coming decades. So in this complex state of affairs, what do we make sense of what's happening with the state of our economy? Um, here today to help us with that is our guest, William Watson. We're delighted to have him here. He was born and raised in Montreal, educated at McGill and Yale. William Watson taught at McGill from 1977 to 2017. He was the chair of economics from 2005 to 10, and he was the acting chair in 2016 and 17. He's best known for his twice weekly witty, dare I say, columns in the Financial Post, and he's written there since 1980. So you have great perspective. And uh, he has authored a number of books, and uh, including Globalization and the Meaning of Canadian Life, published by the U of T. And uh, that was the runner up for the Donner Prize. And uh, we also have the, his most latest book, The Inequality Trap, Fighting Capitalism Instead of Poverty. And I would recommend all those books. So we are just delighted to have you, William, join us today. Welcome. Well, thanks very much, David. It's great to be with you. Um, I am delighted that you could join us because, frankly, um, I think all of us need some type of perspective, dare I say, reality therapy about what is going on today with the state of uh, not only Canada's economy, but our world economy. But I do want to set the stage a little bit. I think you've got an extraordinary background, uh, William. Um, so I want to begin with the simple question, where did you grow up and how did you enter the fascinating world of economics? Well, I grew up in uh, Lachine, Quebec, which is uh, uh, not far from where I am right now in uh, Montreal West, uh, Quebec, and born and raised there and uh, uh, went to elementary school there and uh, high school there and then uh, ended up at uh, McGill University. And uh, how did I get into economics? Well, uh, when I was 16 or 17, my father, who fed me books, uh, sort of continuously and in high volume all through my upbringing, uh, for which I'm very grateful, uh, gave me a copy of uh, The Worldly Philosophers by Robert Heilbrunner, oh, wow. uh, who I guess is a little more left than I ended up to be, but was a terrific writer and told wonderful stories and gave great introductions to the uh, great economists of all time. And I, I thought that was very interesting. I ended up at university. I wasn't quite sure uh, what I wanted to take. I was very interested in English and I um, uh, took a number of uh, English courses, but that seemed to be uh, sort of sitting around a table talking about other people's uh, work. I also took a, an economics course uh, and I was really hooked by that uh, uh, economics course. It was called Government and Business, and uh, basically an industrial organization course uh, talking about industry structure and what, if anything, governments should do about that. Uh, but the prop was uh, terrific, uh, very enthusiastic and energetic, and I got hooked. And uh, so I, I ended up majoring in uh, economics, and then I went to graduate school and got a master's and a PhD in economics, and then I went back to McGill and uh, started teaching it in 1977, and then, as you as you say, I lasted till 2017. So 
Well, that's terrific. Well, we're glad that you got hooked, so to speak, on economics, William. It's an acquired taste. It's not everybody's <laughs> taste, but uh, no, uh, it's... once you've got it, you're in trouble. No, that's great. Well, I have, um, uh, believe it or not, appreciated reading um, your writing, both certainly in the National Post, uh, the Financial Post, but also um, your, your uh, two books that I mentioned. And I want to get to that a little bit later, but I did want to use that perhaps as a little bit of a note. Um, how would you describe then your kind of philosophical or professional approach to economics? How would you self-describe yourself? Well, I guess I'm a liberal in the uh, in the old sense of the word, the uh, uh, 18th and 19th century sense of the word, which is that uh, uh, societies do best when uh, there's a great deal of freedom. Uh, and um, governments are, are obviously necessary in society to help maintain uh, order. Without order, there really isn't going to be any uh, freedom. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, in the balance, uh, I'd, I'd like to see freedom maximized and order and the interventions that are necessary to maintain order minimized. And I, I think that's going to be good for individuals. Uh, and it's also uh, going to enable them to uh, help each other, maybe not out of the goodness of their hearts, but out of the uh, self-interest that Adam Smith uh, talked about, uh, to do things for one another. And I think there's a, a, a good deal of uh, historical evidence that when societies uh, uh, have a good balance between freedom and order and are able to provide uh, both, uh, that uh, the people living in those societies do quite well. And I think we just had a celebration of that with the 70th uh, anniversary of uh, Elizabeth's uh, reign. Uh, the UK obviously is a, a place where uh, in the modern era, this sort of thing really uh, got underway uh, in Holland as well, clearly, but uh, the UK is the prime example. And it, it did more to spread those ideas uh, to North America and to Australia, New Zealand, other places uh, than many other countries did. So uh, I, I come from that uh, background. I think I was more left uh, than I am now when I was young. I think that's probably a well-worn path that people start off on the left uh, and then move to what I think is the center, but other people would regard as the uh, as the right, but that's the perspective I'm coming from. Excellent. So in, in a way, um, would it be accurate to say you just self-describe yourself as kind of a classical liberal then? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot to cover today. I'm really excited about our conversation around the overall state of the economy. And I want to begin with probably one of the biggest questions you probably hear it all the time in your leadership role but where are we headed in terms of an economic slowdown? William, uh, what is your sense of our likely economic future? What is your crystal ball? Well, you know, never forecast, especially about the future. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, I, I start with that uh, proviso that uh, what you're about to hear is worth what you paid for it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but my instinct is, uh, uh, we're going to have a slowdown, uh, and uh, you know, one of the there aren't many advantages to getting older, but uh, um, until things go dark, uh, you do have a memory of uh, what went before. And I, I do remember the 1970s. Uh, I can't say vividly, but uh, I certainly remember the 1970s and the policy dilemmas that people were confronted with at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, primary among them was. Uh, uh, inflation. And of course, uh, we also had the unusual combination of inflation and slow growth uh, uh, that got a, a nickname, stagflation, that uh, uh, we also learned about the misery index when uh, if you added the inflation rate to the unemployment rate and saw how, how badly things got, we were into double digits above uh, 20 in the uh, misery index. We've done much better than that uh, in the last couple of decades. But uh, you know, we're heading into a period that uh, uh, I think is going to be difficult. And uh, a part of the problem is that we haven't been paying attention to the lessons of the 1970s. Uh, uh, it took a long time to 
uh, get un inflation uh, under control. It started more or less in the early 1970s, and it wasn't really until the mid 1980s uh, that we we did have it under control. And uh, uh, people took a sort of casual, uh, moderated approach, a gradual approach, uh, one of uh, bringing it down uh, uh, without any great shock to the economy. At least that was the goal, and it didn't really work. Uh, and only when Paul Volcker applied uh, a real cold shower to the economy and, and created a serious recession, there's no doubt it was a serious recession, did we really get rid of inflation. And exactly. uh, uh, all through last year, many of us were saying, look, uh, you've got targets. The target is 2%. And now we're at three. Now we're at three and a half. Now we're at four and we're going in the wrong direction. And uh, your job as uh, central bankers is to control this thing. And I think uh, the central bank uh, uh, was excessively hope hopeful. Uh, and we heard a lot, of course, about how inflation would be uh, temporary. But uh, the thing about it is that once people begin to develop the expectation that we're gonna have inflation, that's a, a self-fulfilling expectation. Right. And only by killing that expectation do you uh, kill the inflation. Now, as I say, it took almost a decade to kill that expectation, uh, and it took a very bad recession to do it. Uh, and we have, uh, that was policy capital that had been built up. People understood that central banks were now serious about inflation, and they knew how to stop it. And our central bank and many others uh, around the world uh, didn't take uh, fast enough steps, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, to, interesting. To attack you know, inflation. It's, it's going to be harder uh, now that we've waited a year. That's right. So on that note, we've got a lot of actors on this economic stage. Uh, you've alluded to the, the governor of the Bank of Canada. In fact, I remember well your column uh, just a few weeks ago, if I recall. You, you described the situation that if the governor was like a coach of our hockey team, he would be gone. Why did you say that? Well, because I, I think it's true. Okay. Uh, now, it may be that we're too tough on uh, hockey coaches, uh, but when they go into a serious losing streak, their jobs are in, in jeopardy. Uh, I, I think Tiff Macklem is a very uh, capable guy and, uh, uh, you know, one of two or three obvious choices for that uh, job. He has a wealth of uh, experience. Uh, he's also of an age uh, where he should remember the mm -hmm. 1970s. Uh, I think he's a little younger than uh, uh, some of us who were in our prime maybe at that time, uh, but uh, certainly he studied the 1970s right. and uh, lived part of his life uh, through them. And, and I, I think he was uh, slow off the mark in um, worrying sufficiently about uh, the buildup of uh, prices. I think, yeah. you know, I, I give people... Uh, uh, some benefit of the doubt. Uh, we went through uh, a pandemic that uh, is not completely unprecedented. Uh, we did have a similar pandemic in 1920, 1918, 1920, uh, lasted roughly the same uh, time. Uh, our policy approach uh, was quite different. Uh, many economies uh, shut themselves down. And if you're running a central bank when, when uh, other parts of the government are shutting down the economy, I, I got a lot of sympathy for you. You know, what do you do? We, right. As I say, we, we haven't really been through that in an, era, in an era where we had central banks. So for the first six months of the pandemic, I, I cut people a lot of slack. And I certainly wouldn't have wanted to uh, uh, have had their uh, uh, policy jobs. Uh, but uh, I think we began to get the hang of uh, how do you deal with this? Well, it's, you know, aggregate demand against aggregate supply. Uh, we're shutting down a bit of aggregate supply uh, and, and people are shutting it down too because they're reluctant to work. Uh, and at the same time, we're pumping up aggregate demand uh, because we're keeping interest rates really low, uh, basically zero, uh, negative in real terms because we still had a little bit of inflation uh before all of this uh, started uh and and we're also pumping up individual demand because uh, governments are uh, putting a lot of money into the economy a lot of uh uh cash that uh, uh they're 
uh, borrowing and in large part borrowing from uh, central banks. So uh, once you get a feel for that demand supply balance and the fact that demand is growing quite uh, quickly and supply is going in the other direction, it, it wasn't crazy to uh, imagine that what we're going to observe is yeah. inflation. Yeah, and, it wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, I would think it uppermost be? in the central banker's mind has to be if you get a, it's a disease that uh, once you catch it, it's really hard to get rid of. Uh, not the pandemic disease, but the inflation. Yeah. And uh, uh, they uh, should be the people in society who are most aware of that. And I think they, I think, as I say, they were slow off the mark. So when you look from your vantage point as an economist, as an editor of the Financial Post, um, what are the signs that inflationary expectations are clearly ramping up? We see it every day as consumers at the pump, at food prices. It's it's brutal for people's costs. Like it's it's a terrible impact on on uh, Canadians. But in terms of of inflationary expectation, like for example, wage demands, are there particular moments that you see on the horizon where we'll say, "Wow, this train, this inflationary train, is clearly on its way"? Well, yeah, I think uh, the um, sort of most common way to observe these things is uh, with surveys. And uh, the central bank, uh, among other agencies, uh, both in this country and other countries, ask people, what do you think the inflation rate is going to be a year from now? Exactly. What do you think it's going to be three years from now? What do you think it's going to be five years from now? And the great thing about the policy regime we've been in for the last 30 years is that's for three decades been locked in at 2%. What do you think the inflation rate is going to be? two years now, three years now, five years from now, it's going to be 2%. Why is that? Well, that's the target. And and uh, I trust the central bank to hit its target. It's been very good at uh, hitting its target. But now those numbers in the surveys are beginning to creep up. Uh, in the short term, uh, you're seeing numbers like uh, four and, and four and a half percent. Uh, for the five years uh, uh, forecast, uh, it's it's still not that high. Uh, but it's over three, uh, coming up to three and a half. And it's certainly not two. It's no longer locked in at two. And, uh, um, you know, that should be um, flashing lights and alarm bells for a, a central bank when you see something like that. Okay. Now, I think that Bill Robson on our uh, page, uh, Bill Robson of the C.D. Howe Institute, uh, had quite an interesting piece uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I should just say, I don't edit the Financial Post. I edit uh, the Financial Post comment page. So yes. it's just one page of the uh, uh, Financial Post. Um, but he had an interesting piece uh, showing the relationship between inflation and strikes uh, going back to, I think, 1980 or so. And uh, it was quite a startling graph that you had uh, obviously very high inflation in the 80s and you had lots and lots of person days lost to strikes in the 1980s, as the inflation rate came down, so did uh, the number of uh, strike days. So uh, I suspect you're going to see uh, more labor conflict uh, uh, as the inflation rate uh, uh, strays away from what we've come to think of as uh, normal. And, and the point that he made, and I think a lot of economists would make is, well, once you get into a period where you, your inflation expectations are loose, uh, and they're floating around, that does make labor negotiations tough. Exactly. Uh, because one side of the deal may think, well, I got to prepare myself for 5% inflation five years from now. The other side of the deal may be saying, we're only going to have 2% inflation because the bank's going to get uh, things back in order. And then uh, they're essentially would like to arrive at the same real wage bargain, but uh, in inflationary uh, dollars. So uh, there's uh, quite a difference between their positions. So I, I, I suspect we look in the labor market, we're going to see more strife in the labor market. And uh, also, if you look at interest rates, if, if uh, interest rate, if inflation rates, uh, expectations get built in, that's going to cause interest rates to go up on their own without the Bank uh, of Canada doing anything at all. Okay, so this is, I, I think, a, a fascinating um case study where we're at now because you mentioned about the scenario of stagflation kind of the um, kind of a lower growth economy that's emerging higher inflation 
but we've had this prolific spending uh, by government. And certainly one of the questions is, you know, as the money supply increases, the Bank of Canada itself is limited in terms of its ability to kind of put a put a lid on inflation, isn't it? Because, you know, if government's still spending and, and spreading all these dollars around um, and even paying people not to work in, in many respects, um, we're really in a, a really strange kind of situation, aren't we, uh, William, that we haven't quite seen before? Is that fair to say? Let me think. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's uh, fair to say. It's certainly a situation that I I don't remember. I'm trying to think of a wartime situation would be yeah, like we do, uh, somewhat we, like similar today, we because you have you know you're the... you're you're increasing your uh, purchase of arms. Uh, you're restricting the supply of uh, domestic yeah. goods. You're pumping the economy full of money. Uh, so you know maybe maybe there's a parallel there, but it. I mean, it clearly does have, it presents unique uh, problems. And uh, there are many schools of thought on what causes inflation. There's a sort of more or less pure monetarist school where it's essentially the money supply. And there's a modern monetary theory school where it's almost anything but the money supply. I guess I have a, uh, I remember the macroeconomics that I was taught in the 1970s. And uh, uh, it's aggregate demand versus aggregate supply. And uh, you're quite right that uh, uh, governments, uh, and it, I think they had a lot of support in the first six months of the uh, pandemic, uh, were moving in to uh, do all they could to, uh, as the prime minister would repeatedly say, have people's uh, backs uh, and uh, provide uh, income assistance to them when uh, uh, the economy was shutting down and the government was shutting down parts of the economy. You know, part of it was automatic as people just stayed away, but part of it was the government saying, well, you really have to shut down. It's quite unfair to tell people, well, you can't earn a living and then not provide them with any uh, means to sustain themselves. So I think there was a lot of support for that sort of thing. Uh, in retrospect, I, I expect we'll find that uh, people will conclude that the support went on too long. and. You know, it, it's politically understandable. Uh, politicians love to hand things out, and they don't like to take things away. And uh, when they do take things away, there, you know, there's a squealing that uh, takes place, and there may be genuine pain that uh, takes place. But you had the fiscal policy side really pushing hard on the economy uh, by spending a lot more than was being taken in in, in tax, and you also had the monetary policy side. Uh, pushing hard on the economy. So you had this uh, uh, big expansion in aggregate demand at a time when, uh, because of supply chain problems and because of explicit shutting down of parts of the economy, uh, supply was uh, contracting. And so you get a big excess of demand over supply. And uh, uh, it's not surprising that we would get uh, inflation. Exactly, uh, and as, as I say, I think the problem now is we've waited too long to address it. It's it's probably going to require uh, a steeper uh, hike in interest rates than it might have done uh, nine months ago. Okay, uh, so and, uh, I, you know, it, it's not it's not quite the 1970s. Uh, we don't have 12 percent inflation, and the inflation hasn't been uh, powering along for seven or eight years. Uh, so it's not as it doesn't have as much momentum, but it's gathering momentum, and uh, you've got to you can't nip it in the bud in this case, but you've got to get it uh, in its early stages. I think we're still in its early stages in terms of building in permanent expectations. Okay, well let's let's hope you're right, William. I also, um, you know, as much as I study economics as a as a layperson, I would like to. Uh, point out, I thought was a brilliant column that you wrote um, a while ago. You're always welcome to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Think of It as 1975. So I think uh, just for a quick sec, so you've outlined um, a possible recession, but I think what you did in the column was very interesting because you reflect on even bigger kind of strategic picture on where we're at. Um, and I want to get to that. You 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 want to reflect on you, you said basically in this column inflation is out of control 
Central banks are hemming and hawing about whether to raise interest rates. Energy shortages and brownouts are looming in Europe, and I, I would add North America. And you go on to quote later on in the column from The Economist, no less, which says, stopping the further growth of government over the coming decades will be close to impossible. That's the size of government. The most important debates to come will be about the state's nature and not its size. Why did you cite this historical analogy of 1975? Well, it, it's... You know, two or three years before, uh, I, can't, I can't quite remember when Margaret Thatcher became leader. It was 19, very close to 1975. Yeah, right in there, yes. She was elected in 79 uh, for the first time. Uh, but uh, there's a kind of pre-Thatcherite air about things that, uh, I, you know, I thought the Thatcher revolution was permanent. Uh, Tony Blair was supposed to be the labor prime minister who made the Thatcher revolution uh, permanent because he didn't, uh, unlike the prime ministers of the uh, early post-war period, uh, he didn't uh, revoke everything that she'd done. He kept a lot of things uh, uh, in place. But, um, and, and uh, you know, obviously capitalism, uh, free markets, open trade, uh, went through a very good period, uh, had a very good run, uh, certainly from 1979 on. You can uh, date the beginnings of all that into the early 70s when we began to get these economic problems that sort of discredited uh, uh, Keynesian approaches. Uh, and uh, we got to the period in the 90s when uh, history was over and uh, li the liberal capitalist uh, order uh, liberal democratic capitalist order uh, was regarded as the only uh, game in town. And uh, uh, into the 21st century, I think that held true. Then uh, things began to unwind again, uh, certainly with the crash of 2008, which you know, there are different schools of thought about what caused that. Some argue that uh, uh, government intervention, particularly in the U.S., particularly in the housing market, uh, which essentially uh, um, gave rise to the idea that everybody was entitled to a mortgage, whether they could afford one or not, uh, a mortgage-backed, uh, 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 personally owned home, uh, whether they could afford it or not, created uh, a big uh, uh, potential, a big overhang that, uh, uh, a risk overhang that. Uh, eventually collapsed onto the uh, economy. Um, you know, it's not clear there's a, a, an active debate uh, as to how much uh, free markets were responsible for that. But I think in the public's eye, for various reasons, uh, um, that discredited the regime that had gone before. And, and I think that's a pretty natural way of looking at history. Uh, uh, whatever the regime was, when a bad thing happened, it gets blamed for it, whether uh, that blame is uh, uh, justified or or not. Um, and so, you know, things have t started to turn uh, sour uh, for that kind of triumphalist uh, capitalist view. Then we got into a, a long debate about um, inequality. And ironically, uh, we got into the debate of, about inequality uh, just as the biggest shift toward inequality was ending um, towards uh, 2010. Uh, there's been much less movement towards inequality since then than there was from 1990 uh, on, both in this country and in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, people argue that uh, capitalism doesn't do very much for inequality and may even uh, promote uh, inequality. Uh, encourage uh, inequality uh, even. Uh, and that has caused people to take a different view of the government. So I, exactly. there may have been a period in the 80s and 90s when a, a new government proposal or a new pro a proposal for new government measures would have been met with some skepticism and, and uh, uh, clearly opposition from many uh, people who would have thought it was not necessary. Since 2010 or so, 
the, the people standing up for uh, free markets and open trade have had a tougher time of it. There's been much more of a backlash against right. that. And so the, uh, the, the zeitgeist almost to the stage where we're forgetting uh, that whole period from 1975 to 2008. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. the zeitgeist is really about spending, um, prolific spending as well as uh, debts. And it's truly the age, is it not, William, of modern monetary theory? What is modern monetary theory? And do any economists actually believe that money does grow on trees? Well, not anymore. It's made out of polymer. Oh, yes, uh, that's right. And so it's a, it's a petroleum product, uh, a spendable uh, petroleum product, I guess. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what modern monetary theory is. There are certain uh, nostrums that seem to go with it. Uh, one is that you don't really have to worry about the size of the national debt, because as long as you're a country that issues debt mainly in its own currency, and of course, not every country does that, but uh, we do in, in large part, and the United States certainly does, you don't have to worry about your debt, because if uh, push comes to thub, shove and uh, uh, the wolf ends up at your door. You could, you can, you don't print money anymore. Uh, it's all done electronically. Uh, but you can, you know, zap the uh, uh, the bytes, and you can create uh, billions of more bytes, and uh, uh, essentially inflate your way out of, wow. out of that problem. Uh, yes, that's true. Is that a good idea? I, I suspect it's not a good idea. Uh, is a buildup of government debt really? Uh, no problem. Uh, I edited a book with my uh, former McGill colleague, uh, Chris Reagan, uh, called Is the Debt War Over? And uh, we wanted to argue that, no, it wasn't. We should continue to worry about debt and continue to re reduce the debt to GDP ratio. Unfortunately, I think the reaction to that book and to the whole issue suggested that yes, the debt war is over and that people aren't nearly yeah. as uh, concerned about debt uh, as they were. I remember uh, in a former life, I was uh, editor of uh, Policy Options Magazine and got to interview um, uh, former finance minister, Paul Martin, when he was actually a uh, finance minister and, and talked about debt. And uh, uh, this was in the mid uh, 1990s. And he said, you know, the public is way ahead of us in Ottawa on the debt. Uh, when I go and talk to people, I get uh, much more concern uh, expressed about rising levels of debt than I do uh, uh, certainly in, in government circles or in the in uh, uh, so-called you know um, intellectual elites or uh, the chattering classes or however you want to uh, describe them and. Uh, uh, I guess my reaction to him then was, well, you know, why don't you take the people's lead and why don't you follow them? And uh, he did uh, uh, over time by reducing the debt to GDP uh, ratio. I, I think that uh, gave us uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, it wasn't wholly his idea. It wasn't wholly his initiative. The uh, conservatives had started before him, but they had a big uh, mountain of debt to try to uh, uh, dig down. And uh, uh, I, th I think we got better economic performance once we got the debt down to a manageable level. To my eyes, it's, it's, it's not so much a question of economic efficiency as it is of uh, fairness. That, uh, you know, by and large, if you want something out of the government as a generation, you should pay for it. Right. Uh, you shouldn't let your kids pay for it. Uh, and uh, too often uh, in recent years, we've taken the approach that, well, it's good for the economy if you have this big debt, and that'll keep things running. And uh, eventually that'll end up being good for the kids. Or uh, we're borrowing a lot of money to build things that they will uh, benefit from. If that were true, well, you know, that's an argument, but I'm not sure that it's true. I think we've been. Uh, uh, as uh, people have phrased it in, in Quebec, we've been borrowing to pay the groceries, to buy the groceries, not to um, exactly. build up build up our uh, infrastructure yeah. or capital. So or, this is clearly a you know a spiral to to nowhere ultimately. Um, I think so, and and just unfair. Uh, and also, there's the question of 
interest payments because you have to make these interest payments. Exactly. Uh, and um, you've got tax revenue coming in. You've got a certain amount of borrowing that you can do, but bigger and bigger interest payments put a squeeze on your total expenditures. And uh, that means they end up crowding out uh, what can be quite useful things. Uh, many people on the left would say useful things in government. We on the right, if I can include you in that, might say useful tax cuts, uh, exactly. lower taxes. Yeah. And uh, we, we benefited from uh, fiscal responsibility uh, following, uh, I don't know, 1989, 1990. We can start it with the conservatives, certainly carried through with the uh, uh, liberal government and Jean Chrétien and with uh, Martin as finance minister and the people who followed Martin as mm -hmm. finance minister. I think, the, I think the economy benefited from that. I think future generations benefited from it. And I think current generations benefited mm -hmm. from it. So just to um, switch topics a little bit in the related area of productivity in Canada, um, what's, what's, how's Canada doing in terms of uh, productivity? Uh, is that so foundational to our our standard of living. Well, yeah, and then, you know how much you produce. Um, I, well, I guess there's a school of thought that says that stuff you produce is not very important. We don't get our joy out of uh, material things right. and, and so on. But I guess that's an argument for the service sector as opposed to mm -hmm. material material things. But um, I, I think a lot of the things that are very nice in life and um, can be even spiritually fulfilling are things that get produced. Uh, and uh, even if you want to do travel, uh, somebody's got to build planes and uh, um, electric vehicles, if that's your preference, or uh, you know, feed the camels that you want to travel on. Uh, there's a lot of materialism to uh, these uh, deeper spiritual things. And uh, uh, so it, it seems to me that you want, you generally want more GDP uh, more output uh, if you can get it. So um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the measure of your standard of living is how many choices do you have access to? How many things do you have access to? How many sources of enjoyment do you have and fulfillment do you have access to? So yeah, I think there's an intimate relationship between productivity and all those good things. And it's therefore important to have productivity increase uh over so, time so how would you say canada is doing uh, william on productivity well, not as well as it used to and uh, uh you know one of the difficulties is we have too many explanations for uh why productivity is not uh doing well um uh the um there have been a number of studies uh uh, Don Drummond, I guess, who was, has been uh, involved in policy in Canada for the last 30 years, generally in a very beneficial way, uh, I think. Uh, at one stage, uh, around 2010, sort of summarized all the productivity studies and, and uh, found that, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've explained uh, about 170% of the decline in productivity. <laughs> uh, we, you know, this study will attribute 40% of it to insufficient capital per worker. This study will uh, attribute 60% uh, of it to insufficient R&D per worker and uh, total factor productivity is uh, deficient and so on. And we have, we have too many explanations. Um, where does it come from? It comes from doing things smarter and better. Where does that come from? I don't think that comes from the ministry. Uh, I don't think that comes from the cabinet or from the prime right. minister's office even. Uh, I think that comes, it doesn't come from me because I you know, basically don't know how to do anything. Uh, <laughs> but there are lots of people out there in the society uh, that are very good at figuring out how to do things better. And um, you know, it's the particular knowledge of, or it's the knowledge of particular circumstance and place. Uh, to misquote uh, Friedrich Hayek in that famous uh, article. Uh, and I think what you got to do is not have panels on productivity, not write reports about productivity. You got to let people in the economy uh, get to it. Exactly. And yeah. Create those put them in a situation where, you know, carrots and sticks. Uh, one carrot from higher productivity is, well, you might make 
more money. Uh, if your output is going up uh, and the, the stuff you're selling uh, is still uh, desired, uh, you're going to do better in that way. No, and precisely. it also sticks. Yeah. Uh, and the market provides sticks because if, if you don't look after your productivity, if you don't innovate in the ways you are doing whatever it is that you do for a living, somebody else is going to do it better. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't read many of these books uh, from uh, entrepreneurs after they've uh, succeeded, but uh, a number of them, I, I, I seem to remember Bill Gates saying, you know, he got up every morning scared to death when he was uh, building up Microsoft and then head of Microsoft, that somebody else was going to come and steal his lunch. And the real go to making sure you did things better was this uh, competitive uh, impulse, which was not a question of greed or, you know, maybe some of these folks are uh, greedy, but by and large, I don't think many of them have enough time to enjoy uh, all the spoils of their exploitation, mm -hmm. if uh, you want to put it in terms the left would uh, uh, appreciate. I think they're really just dedicated to uh, what it is that they're doing and attempting to do it better and attempting to do it in a way that's going to take over a world market. They want to become demanded in a world uh, market. Um, I don't see a lot that government can do to tell them, you know, how to do it better. Uh, I can see that if government left them alone uh, and didn't require them to come and consult with all these panels and didn't require them to jump through hoops in various ways, but let them have freer reign, uh, I, I tend to think that's where you're going to get them being their most active and, and creative. It's and uh, so, you know, we, I write columns saying we've got to address uh, productivity and uh, uh, colleagues uh, at the Post write columns saying we do need a growth panel and we need a, maybe a royal commission and, and so on. I'm nervous about that. I think what we need is governments to lower taxes, provide those carrots uh, and keep markets open and not play favorites. And uh, one of the first things I ever wrote as an economist was uh, a primer on the economics of industrial policy. This was for the old Ontario Economic Council, when, which uh, went out of business not long after that study was published. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, what bothers me about industrial policy is uh, people in business will start dedicating their time to trying to figure out, well, how do I get the most out of the government? Exactly. And people in government will spend their time playing at being business people. You see these uh, ministers going around to various plants and, and uh, snipping ribbons and handing out checks and so on. They seem delighted. What joy it is to be associated with these big, efficient, uh, forward-looking uh, institutions uh, you, you never went into business yourself. Maybe you couldn't do arithmetic or you didn't have the uh, urge to uh, get in on the business side. But now you're minister and you get to go around and, and pretend yeah, that, uh, imagine that you're helping the whole thing operate. So, yeah. you know, I would I, I, once or twice uh, I was invited to um, Department of Industry uh, conferences and uh, uh, I was uh, a somewhat impolite guest because my recommendation was always that the federal government shut down the Department of Industry. <laughs> if, Very good. if you have capitalism, you don't need a minister of industry. Um, so just related to this whole thinking about government in the way, it's happening now, ironically, it seems to be in business in the sense that we have, um, you've written a lot about um, ESG, the Environmental Social Governance. Uh, it's big in the news. There's been a lot of harsh criticism, including by yourself and, and so many others. Um, the absurdity of BlackRock Capital is one example, and Larry Fink using our money to essentially use our pension money for woke causes. How does that strike you? Is, that, is it running its course, and why is it so embedded in the financial industry? This is doing a lot of, um, dare I say, uh, destruction to Canada, and then meanwhile, they invest in China and totally, you know, turn a blind eye to the absurdity of what's going on in China. So what do you think about ESG quickly? Well, I think I think your last point is that they're not doing ESG very well, mm. right? That uh, if China has high ESG scores, there's something wrong with the, uh, the way they're scoring ESG. 
Um, in some regards, it'll have high scores, but uh, um, you know, I'd be I'd be shocked if uh, the, the totals were high compared to many country, many companies in this country and uh, the United States and Europe and uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, but even if you're doing ESG correctly, I think it's a mistake. Uh, uh, and uh, I've done a little bit on this, but the, the person on our page who um, has been most uh, effective in uh, um, really, uh, uh, you know, cutting this whole thing down to size and, and uh, trying to deflate it uh, is uh, Terrence Corcoran. And, you know, the, the business of business should be business. Uh, it, it's, I, I think there's something wrong with the business class that they feel guilty that uh, they don't worry sufficiently about these big world uh, issues. They're all citizens. Uh, I hope some of them will have at least some spare time. Uh, some will have disproportionate uh, influence. They're certainly welcome to be interested in, in these issues and to vote however they wish to vote. And some of them may decide after a time in business, uh, they should get into politics themselves. But you know, when they're running their business, they're, what they have knowledge of, uh, this uh, special uh, knowledge of uh, time and place is their particular business. Uh, they're knitting, the, as people uh, talk about uh, how they should stick to their knitting. Uh, yep. They really know knitting. They don't know all that much about uh, yeah. what is the best environmental policy. No, well said. Um, what is the best uh, government for China or for, for Canada? Uh, what's the best way to, uh, as a society, uh, institute uh, diversity? Um, I don't want to denigrate the contributions that they might have, but but I think those should be in their role as citizens, not in their role as business exactly. uh, leaders. Well, I I noticed, and, and um, they do they do great good by producing great knitting. Yeah, that that's their mission, and they and they should do it well. I, I just um, noticed, if memory serves me correctly, the the Canadian pension plan was, according to its own ESG rankings, uh, investing money in Russian Russian oil and gas over Canada. I mean, this is the absurdity of it. And um, speaking, of which I think you had a very good column that if we want to support democracy, we should be exporting more Canadian oil and gas in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Right. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true, uh, and uh, um, you know the war on oil and gas I think has had a number of bad effects. Once uh, uh, a major gas and oil supplier is uh, uh, put in Coventry and uh, uh, is uh, being boycotted, you, you want to be able to replace that stuff. But uh, you've had a concerted effort over the last uh, number of years to. Uh, essentially suppress uh, uh, the oil and gas industry. It hasn't been completely effective because there are political uh, realities that have to be uh, faced, but I think it, it has been a very short-sighted, uh, and, and I won't say uh, uh, every week, but almost every week on our page, uh, we have people making the point that, uh, uh, you know, even if you want to move in a uh, reduced carbon direction, uh, having gas replace coal is a step forward. Exactly. Uh, and uh, we have the reserves of uh, oil and gas uh, that can help make that possible. And it just, it seems uh, crazy in my view to uh, not take advantage of those uh, resources. So uh, no, right I do on. think there's an externality associated with the consumption of carbon. Uh, and uh, I don't know quite how big that externality is. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not zero. Uh, and so I would take this problem uh, seriously. But uh, as an economist, uh, uh, my preference would be let's price carbon. If we can get some sort of price on carbon and apply it uniformly across our own country and also around the world, uh, I think that's the best way. And then you take it the best way to address the problem because you don't micromanage. You just mm -hmm. don't have the knowledge of how industries operate. There may be ways that industries can cut back on their carbon consumption uh, that people sitting in Ottawa or Queens Park or uh, Edmonton can't, uh, they, I mean, they don't know the first thing about them and yeah. uh, they should recognize that they don't know the first thing about them. 
Uh, and uh, once you, you price the damage that's being done and, and provide incentives for people to reduce their uh, uh, production of uh, carbon into the atmosphere, uh, you're going to get a, a more efficient uh, result. You're going to get a least cost uh, way of doing that. Now, I, you know, immediately uh, the, the problem arises is that uh, uh, we've got 200 countries. We don't have one country around the world. We have 200 countries and they are all taking different approaches. And uh, there's one in particular that's doing an awful lot of uh, spewing of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. And uh, it has not so far raised the price on carbon to levels that uh, we would like to see. So, yeah, and, and I suspect that'll never happen as we find that uh, the demand for fossil fuels uh, has never been higher and continues to speed up. And it's almost like we're in our more, dare I say, uh, bubble when it comes to understanding uh, the use of fossil fuels in the world, not, not just simply Canada. Yeah, I mean, never is a long time. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you look at if you look at the world of 1750 and see how energy use evolved from 1750 on, I, there are big big changes. Yes, well taken. That have taken place. That's uh, right. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, 2200, 2300, lots of things can happen that uh, you right. and I can't imagine. Yeah. So we'll uh, see what the but, big transition. Uh, I looks think for like. the for the relatively near term, the next two or three decades. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, completely unrealistic to think that you're going to get rid of uh, fossil fuel use. And it, uh, there is a net in net zero. Uh, and I guess the argument is that we're going to plant an awful lot of trees. I guess so. That would that would make a lot of sense, William. We're, we're kind of getting towards the end of our session. I did want to cover a few um, key questions. And one of them, William, has to do with... Um, your your books um that you wrote about inequality and i very much enjoyed your book called um basically it was about the inequality trap fighting capitalism and not poverty and i still remember uh barack obama made the the famous quote i, I was i was kind of gobsmacked by it basically saying the defining issue of our time is the whole issue of inequality and in many ways during that time you came you know there's the occupy wall street movement and this um really edgy movement against capitalism in many ways it, it continues in full force um and other guises uh, like wokeism and you know cultural marxism and all the rest but what what were you what was your essential point like i was struck by bill marno's comment a few weeks ago as the former finance minister saying that you know on reflection he was struck by the the current governments being obsessed with redistribution rather than building prosperity building a bigger pie if you will for the win-win for everybody is that is that the essential point william yeah the the um uh fighting capitalism instead of uh, poverty is the subtitle and uh, i think we all need to be concerned about uh, poverty, and, I, and by and large, most people are concerned about yeah. poverty. But poverty and inequality are different things. Uh, you could have a, a country in which no one was poor, mm -hmm. but the people at the top could have a thousand times as much as the people at the bottom. That's inequality. Now, some people argue that that's not a good way to run a society, even if it's a completely poverty-free society. I I think you know once we get to that. Uh, we can worry about it, but we're not at that. We still have problems with uh, poverty. Uh, we've made progress in that regard. Poverty rates are are down. There have been uh, a number of policies introduced uh, over the last 30 years that have moved money to people at the bottom of the income distribution. The poverty rate among uh, single mothers uh, used to be 40%. It's now well under 20%. Maybe that's still too high, but uh, it's not 40% anymore. Uh, so I think that's the real problem. Uh, we've made progress towards that. What's the best way to continue to make progress? It seems to me economic growth uh, is, is uh, what you really need. Even if you're a redistributionist, 
even if you think you won't solve the poverty problem without giving to people at the bottom, who for one reason or another can't provide for themselves, uh, growth is going to help you in that because uh, it'll take a smaller tax rate if people have higher incomes. It's a smaller tax rate, which they will mind less uh, to transfer a given amount to people at the bottom. So exactly, yeah. I, I think a, a, a pro-growth, pro-market approach uh, in theory is the best approach. And in practice, the last 30 years uh, were the time in human history when the largest numbers of people, literally hundreds of millions, if not small numbers of billions in the billions, of people were lifted out of poverty. Now, the, the barrier that they had to get over was not a high barrier, uh, $1.50 a day income, $2 a day income, something of that sort. But that's the barrier that many of them had not been able to get over until uh, we had this uh, period of opening up of markets, the liberalization of China, uh, which, you know, China didn't become terribly liberal, but it became much more liberal than it was under Mao. Uh, maybe we're, it's moving back in that direction now. It's not there yet, obviously, but uh, the liberalization of China, the liberalization of India as well, lifted uh, hundreds of millions of people out of uh, poverty, began to create middle classes in those countries, and um, I, you know, I, I think uh, eventually helps create the the values that middle classes around the world exactly uh, have. So uh, more growth, uh, attention to poverty, not really worry about inequality much. Attack privilege. Um, I, I, the policy proposal was effectively you attack privilege. People who have essentially co-opted the government for their own purposes mm. And we can think of industries that ask for protection from imports, that industries that ask for uh, regulation of uh, prices, that ask for quota and so on on uh, production, uh, ask for protection from foreign investors, uh, things like that. Those are sort of Canadian examples of this type of uh, privilege. Uh, let's go after those folks. Privatization. Uh, let's go after people who, uh, professionals who exclude potential uh, competitors uh, by artificially uh, raising the hurdles that people have to go through to, um, uh, what, what was the piece in the New York Times uh, yesterday, or maybe it was the Wall Street Journal, why is it harder to become an engineer in this country than a soldier? And, <laughs> you know, it, 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 uh, you got to know stuff to become an engineer, but it probably doesn't take as long uh, shouldn't take as long as it, it does to get uh, qualified. So uh, go after privilege in every one of its forms. Now, of course, privilege is a loaded term in in uh, wokedom. Uh, and I, I wasn't aware at the time that it was going to become so loaded, but I would ally myself with those who, uh, I, I don't think it's exclusively associated with one uh, ethnic group uh, or one color or, you know, one region or anything of that sort, but where it does exist, I think most people's reaction is that's not fair. Exactly. And, uh, let's open things up. Let's let people compete. Let's go for a meritocracy. You bet. That sounds like a great vision, uh, William. I do want to um, posit the uh, the final question to you, and that would be related to dare I say a little bit of hope or solution as Canada's. Um, certainly struggling with its economy, our state of affairs, and the need to emphasize merit, as you say, and, and opportunity to get rid of regulation. But um, it's interesting, uh, one of uh, our friends at Frontier is, of course, Conrad Black, and he he did, a, I think, a very insightful column, uh, column. And he cited how, according to his information, Canada in the 1950s and 60s was arguably the second most wealthiest nation um, in the world. It's, it's really quite a remarkable uh, statistic. And today we would be um, uh, 20th um, in terms of those scales. And today I was also talking with a friend of Frontier who 
manages on, an awful lot of money um, on behalf of, of investors. And it almost seems like one of the, the, the seminal things that Canada really has to wrap its heads around, particularly with the leadership classes, why are we not seen? We have everything going for us as a country. It's geography, it's people, it's opportunity, it's astounding. Why are we not the premier destination for uh, capital investment? And if we look at areas like agriculture, agriculture alone, or oil and gas, another ACE card in Canada, why is it that we can't develop a vigorous vision for prosperity and knock it out of the park, William? What, like from your point of view, why is that vision not top of mind in our country? And what can we do to move that ball forward from your point of view? Well, I guess a lot of people argued we're uh, resource rich and policy poor. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, we have this, uh, uh, we've had this difficulty for a long time that people feel guilty about uh, uh, exploiting, even the word exploit, natural resources. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess my reaction to that is you're not doing any favors to the people who don't have natural resources if you don't exploit, produce, sell uh, your own. Uh, but we're clearly of two minds about that. We Even before there were environmental concerns, I think we were um, sheepish about, uh, I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay, but I'm not very smart. Uh, and, uh, you know, Japan was clearly a place where people were extremely clever and, well, they had to be, they didn't have any resources. Uh, we could get along with low IQs and uh, uh, merely chop down trees and dig things uh, out of the ground and, and ship them off to people, hewers of wood and drawers of water. And then uh, added to that, there is an environmental concern that some of the things that you do leave uh, traces that last for a very long time and maybe are even uh, irreparable. But, uh, you know, I, th I think we need to get over that. Uh, a lot of the resource things we do are quite complicated and require pretty high IQ. and uh, uh, if, if we're still of a mind to worry about that sort of thing, I think we can stop uh, worrying about it. Many of the things that are done in Alberta are very sophisticated. The production techniques that are run. Uh, is there an environmental problem? Yes, I think there is. Uh, not just uh, carbon, but uh, you know, tailings uh, did damage and got into uh, uh, water systems and so on. We know about that stuff now. We can take care of that uh stuff so i it seems to me we can get over uh guilt and concern of that sort and and proceed and, and still take advantage of the great resource endowment that we have uh if we are busy on that uh you know labor markets respond to where people are more productive it may be that we're not going to be as focused on other things and some other people um will uh, undertake those things and will trade with them you know they don't have anything else that they can do. They don't have any resources that they can uh, exploit. So 0% of their population is going to be involved in the exploitation of uh, resources, the production of resources, whereas maybe 20% of ours will and uh, will be otherwise uh, occupied. Um, there are, I think, uh, first of all, the 1950s income comparisons, they're very difficult to do. Uh, I think we were higher in the ranking uh, partly because Europe was still still looked a lot like parts of Ukraine does today uh, and was still getting back on its uh, feet. Um, uh, in absolute terms, people are wealthier. Canadians on average are, are wealthier than they were then in relative terms to other countries, perhaps uh, not so much. I think there are these Arthur Schlesinger Sr., uh, the U.S. historian argued that there were policy cycles. Mm. And you'd go through 20 or 25 years of a sort of liberal approach. Uh, in his view, an interventionist 20th century liberal approach. And then you would move to 20 or 25 years, partly in reaction to all the bad things that had happened as a result, uh, to a more conservative approach. And I guess in our early, earlier part of the conversation, we were almost getting to that, that uh, 
clearly things were moved in a leftward direction until about 1975. And after 1975, they moved in a more market oriented direction. And after 2008, things have switched. Well, we're back to the 1970s now. And uh, uh, maybe after time, uh, people are going to find that uh, wokeism isn't very good and inflation is uh, not something that you want to uh, uh, impose on yourself. And uh, there are virtues to uh, uh, growth. And it's not fair that the government comes and takes away half of uh, uh, what people earn in a day uh, and, uh, and so on. So I, uh, growing up in the 1970s, or at least coming to intellectual, I hope, uh, a form of maturity in the 1970s, uh, I never thought there would be a Canada-U.S. free trade agreement. That seemed to me impossible. The, the Canadian political coalitions would always prevent it. And the Canadian uh, self-image compared to the United States would never allow it. And lo and behold, uh, 15 years later, we had a Canada-U.S. Uh, free trade agreement. And now it seems part of the woodwork. Uh, there really isn't much opposition to it. It's been... I think uh, manipulated in the wrong direction by the United States, but uh, I don't think there's much uh, opposition to it. So uh, again, uh, one advantage of getting older is you do develop little perspective. Uh, things may seem quite bad now. I think there will be natural responses that, uh, that take place that help improve things. Well, thank you very much, uh, William Watson, for your perspective today and kind of that sweeping sense of both history and your insights and an economist and of course as an author we really appreciate you being with us today william i enjoyed talking to you that's it for uh today's session with um policy on the frontier we uh, are so grateful that you could join us and uh we also want to thank every one of you as friends of frontier who joined us today and for your ongoing support um, keep involved with The Frontier, and we welcome your comments, and be sure to join us for our next Policy on the Frontier, and uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today again. Frontier is nonpartisan, and we do not accept any government funding, and uh, that is it for today. And remember, without open discussion and debate, you are not thinking, and nor are you free. Keep asking good questions, and do not be afraid. My name is David Leeson. On behalf of all of us at the Frontier, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>